That's how I protect me and my mental health. If you know wholeheartedly that you have not done nothing to a mother that's kirking on you, you know what? Let me call you back. <laughs> Michael was admitted to St. John's Hospital and Healthcare Center in Santa Monica. He was gripping his chest and looked dizzy, pale and weak. It was later reported that he had suffered chest pains while doing his Sunday dance exercises. The hospital immediately ran a battery of diagnostic tests, including an HIV test. Turbo Lele, stop it, girl. Girl, they was doing that to everybody back then. Mm. Michael's blood work came back from the lab negative, as expected. Good save, Turbo Lele. However, it was determined that he suffered from an enzyme deficiency and was anemic, probably due to his strict vegetarian diet. Child, I don't know one black person that ain't anemic. That's that's the black way. If you didn't know that he was black before, you know now. Michael's hospitalization made headlines for days. President Bush, Liza Minnelli, and Elton John all telephoned to wish him well. Catherine and other family members visited. Latoya sent a dozen black roses, an odd gesture, but said Latoya, "I think they're beautiful." Fans held all-night vigils outside of the hospital. It was reported that Michael was diagnosed as having a condition called costochondritis, a cartilage inflammation in the front part of the ribs, an ailment most commonly found in young athletes who exercise sporadically. The condition is caused by overexertion and stress. After Michael was released from the hospital, he went about the business of reorganizing his affairs. He had said privately that when he returned from the bad tour, he would fire everyone on his staff. I don't trust anybody, he said to one associate, except Catherine. Paul. Remember in the last video when I said Michael the Jackson don't have allegiance to nobody? I meant that shit. Virgos don't have allegiance to nobody. Because, let's think about this. He looked at, and this is something rare that a lot of people don't think of. It seemed you know? to me that Michael Jackson was always looking for a father. It was like, okay, Joe Jackson, my daddy. Then he found a father figure in Barry Gordy, Quincy Jones, Frank Dillio. And we'll find out later that Michael couldn't control John Bronca the way he did Frank Dillio. Frank Dillio, you can't have nobody else but me. I'm going to do me, but you can't do nothing else. Okay, until I tell you to do something else. He had all these male figures, including David Geffen, who he looked up to like fathers. And then turn around, when he done with you, he done with you. And I remember seeing that special where one of the children who were involved with that special, we know what it is, uh, when he was done with the children, he was done with the children. Frank Dillio had been dismissed after the tour was over. And Michael apparently felt no regret over the decision. He still communicated with Frank, but only through middlemen and only when he was agitated about something. For instance, when Michael heard that someone was again spreading rumors that he was a homosexual, he had an associate telephone Frank demanding to know if it had been he who was the source of the story. Frank was hurt. He later said he wondered how a person he once considered to be a son could be so mistrusting of him. <laughs> I'm wondering, you the only person wondering, Frank Diddley Leo. Because everybody else know that nigga don't have allegiance to nobody. After the bad tour, Marshall Gelfand Michaels 
accountant of seven years, was given his walking papers by John Bronca. Michael felt he was too conservative in his investment strategies and had John hire a new accountant, Richard Sherman, who also worked for David Geffen. And Devin Geffen, David Geffen, is that ninja right now. Until he ain't. Okay. By the summer of 1990, Michael had also begun to have doubts about John Bronca. David Geffen's personal feelings about John colored his perception of the high-powered attorney. For instance, Michael suddenly became overly concerned about the identities of John's other clients. Frank Dillio was not permitted by Michael to even have other clients, but John was an attorney who had been practicing law before the day in early 1980 when Michael came into his office. By 1990, he had 25 clients in addition to Michael. You know, Michael, with his ass, he got issues. You know, nobody can be here with you but me. John finally admitted that he was representing the Rolling Stones tour. Well, is it a big tour, Michael asked? It's not going to be bigger than mine, is it? There was probably no way to calm Michael down at that point. Next, he wanted to know where the Stones would be playing. When John reluctantly told him they were thinking about the Los Angeles Coliseum, Michael became even more anxious. The Coliseum? The Coliseum? Why, that's bigger than the Los Angeles Sports Arena, where I played. How many dates? They're not playing as many dates as me, and my brothers played at Dodger Stadium. Are they? He was frantic. The only way to end it with him was for John to beg off the line, saying he had another call. Boom. Listen, this is what I do in order to protect my spirit. You're welcome. As we get older, we get wiser, hopefully. All right? And as I've gotten older, trying to take care of my mental health, because that's what's important to me right now, my mental health. I rarely... Almost 0 0.05 argue with people or go back and forth with people. When I realize, wait a minute, this person is having either a bad day, somebody else then pissed them off, or something didn't happen with them because I know in my heart I haven't done shit to you. Okay. Oh, my most spectacular feat is when people be tripping. Oh, you know what? Let me call you back right quick. Because you're not about to release that energy on me. That's how I protect me and my mental health. If you know wholeheartedly that you have not done nothing to a motherfucker that's kirking on you. You know what? Let me call you back. I'm not even going to say. I might say if I love you. You having a bad day? If I love you. Okay. But other than that. Oh shit. I'll be back. Let me go to the bathroom. Oh, you know what? I Oh, ah, I forgot something in my car. I'll be right back. Because I'm not about to go back and forth with you. You're not about to drag my energy down to the gutter with yours because you having a bad day. And we all have them. John Bronca took on Terrence Trent Darby. Michael asked John to drop DRB. He considered DRB competition just as he did Prince. John said he would do it if Michael absolutely insisted upon it. However, Michael then telephoned DRB, with whom he had never spoken, to let him know that he, Michael, had no control over John Bronca, and that if the attorney should ever drop him as a client, it would be entirely his decision. Because, as Michael told DRB, I have no problem with Bronca representing you. Actually, Michael was trying to maintain friendly relations with DRB in case the two should ever decide to record a duet sometime in the future. When John Bronca found out what Michael had done, Terrence Trent DRB's manager telephoned John immediately after DRB had hung up with Michael. He was so disappointed in Michael as he was angry. In the end, John decided not to drop DRB as a client. 
Michael just had to live with it. Most observers felt that representing Michael had become more taxing and demanding than ever for John Bronco. Absolutely. At this same time, David Geffen, you know that's his new daddy, okay, was trying to convince Michael that he should break his CBS Records deal by utilizing a contract loophole. Michael's contract with CBS had been signed in 1983 and then amended after Thriller in 1985. David felt that the seven years that had lapsed since the original agreement gave Michael an edge in renegotiating the entire deal because California state law forbids personal service contracts of a longer duration. Industry observers felt that David was trying to lure Michael away from CBS so that he could sign him to his own label. That sounds about right. That's nigga shit if I ain't never heard of, you know. And 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 Michael Jackson is attracted to slime because he was raised by slime. That would be the Joseph Jackson. CBS Records could have mounted a huge lawsuit against Michael. David was willing to overlook the possible litigation. It'll all work itself out, he said. However, John Bronco was not willing to do so. And he was the one representing Michael, not David. When John and David engaged... In a heated argument over the logic of trying to extricate Michael from his recording contract with CBS, John told him to mind his own business. David hung up on him. Good. Fuck him. Everybody ain't scared of you, David Geffen. You ain't nobody. David then telephoned Michael and apparently tried to sell him on John Bronca by saying that John had been uncooperative and that the reason Michael didn't have a good deal at CBS was because of John's close relationship with the company president, Walter Yitnikoff. Michael allowed himself to be swayed by David, never stopping to consider that he truly did have the best deal in the record industry and that John Bronco was the man who had secured it for him. John Bronco's work with Michael Jackson can only be compared to Colonel Tom Parker's representation of Elvis Presley. I told y'all, that Elvis movie was incredible. And I'm not just saying it because I'm a Tom Hanks fan. I, I could be. I could be. But that movie was definitely incredible. John Bronco's work with Michael Jackson can only be compared to Colonel Tom Parker's representation of Elvis Presley. Even though John was not Michael's manager, he certainly had the kind of impact on his career that Colonel Tom had on Elvis's. In 1980, when John began representing him, Michael net worth was barely a million dollars. Ten years later, in great part due to John's negotiating skills, the net worth was close to 300 million, including the publishing holdings, which were valued at close to 200 million. That leap in holdings was a tribute to Michael's artistry, no doubt, but it also spoke well of John's negotiation skills. Despite all they had been through together, Michael now doubted John. A couple of days after John's difficult conversation with David Geffen, John met with Michael. Something had changed in Michael and it became clear as the two of them spoke. Michael barely listened to what John said and he seemed hostile towards him. The two engaged in a heated discussion about CBS and whether or not Michael was obliged to record for them. The meeting did not go well. When it ended, John went back to his office in Century City. The next day he received a letter by special messenger from Michael's new accountant, Richard Sherman, whom John had recently hired. John's services were no longer required by Michael Jackson. Michael was sorry to lose John Bronco, but he didn't get sentimental about the loss. The way he looked at it, John made a fortune doing what he loved to do, representing Michael in major show business deals. When it was over, it was over. Michael swiftly replaced him with three seasoned law veterans, Beecham Fields for litigation, Alan Grubman 
for negotiations with CBS and Lee Phillips for music publishing, all closely associated with David Geffen. Now that motherfucker may be the devil. In March 1991, Michael Jackson finally came to terms with CBS Records, now known as Sony Corp. May 1992. Michael Jackson standing on the side of Wilshire Boulevard in Beverly Hills. His Jeep steaming at the side of the road while other cars whisked by in two busy lanes in both directions. With so little knowledge about automobiles, Michael had always wondered what he would do if he was ever alone when his car broke down. You say that you love me. 